About 65 million Americans experience this pain from each year. Major healthcare spending, a whopping 12 billion annually. Gen Z experiencing more pain now than older generation. Many are calling this the tech neck pain, osteoporosis. That's a condition where the bones become brittle and become more prone to fractures. When you're doing a spine surgery, complications can occur. Patients don't want it, surgeons don't want it, no, no one wants it. It. We have what's called ERAS, enhanced recovery after surgery, faster surgeries, less pain, faster recovery. Today, we're diving into a very specific topic that impacts nearly everyone at some point, whether it's a dull ache from poor posture, thanks to the hours of being on the phone or hunched over a desk or getting just sharp pain from injury, road traffic accidents, for example. Back pain is the most common musculoskeletal complaint in the US. About 65 million Americans experience this pain from each year, making it the leading cause of missed work days and a major healthcare spending, a whopping 12 billion annually for surgical costs alone. When it comes to treating back pain, there is no one size fit for all solutions. Non-operative options include physical therapy, chiropractic, injections like epidural, acupuncture, and bracing. And evidence backs up many of these choices. Physical therapy and manual manipulation can significantly reduce the symptoms for a lot of patients. Even mediation and massage therapy are gaining attraction for chronic pain relief. For about 5 to 10% of these cases, surgery is the only answer. And it's here that cutting edge, minimal evasive techniques are reshaping recovery in some truly amazing ways. Welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics, powered by the health section of American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Our guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Wong a professor of clinical orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery in Los Angeles. He has special focus on minimally invasive neck and spine surgery. His work has helped countless patients return to their lives faster than ever before. Dr. Wang has been recognized with several prestigious honors, including the 2020 Spine Advocacy Award from the North American Spine Society, and also the Senior Achievement Award from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. With advances in spine surgery, we've come a long way from traditional methods. So let's explore what's new in the world of spine surgery and how personalized care is making back pain less of a pain in the back. Dr. Wang, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Wang, let's dive right into it. Back pain, as you know, is now affecting younger generations. And in fact, a recent poll revealed that 63% of people reported back pain or neck pain, with the Gen Z experiencing more pain now than older generation. Many are calling this the tech neck pain. Tell us, what's your approach in treating these problems of the back? For example, the degenerations or herniated discs, and then we'll explore the surgical options afterwards. Well, it's important to understand how common it is. And I, I loved your introductory comments because it did sort of set the stage that the vast majority of the people regardless of where you live, you're gonna have some back pain or, or neck pain in your lifetime. I think number one, the important thing to understand is it's very common. So if you get it, you know, it's it's not uncommon. Don't, don't freak out. Don't feel like, oh, I'm gonna uh, need surgery. Uh, the second thing is that um, there are a lot of conservative treatments and the vast majority of the people get better with conservative care. So when you get it, don't automatically think you're gonna need surgery. But I, I think one of the points that you really made, which it concerns me the most, is that we're starting to see this in younger people. And I think it has to do with the technology and it has to do with our posture. When your mother told you, you need to stand up straight, she was right. Think about it when you're on your computer and you're craning your neck forward and you're putting st stress on your neck and back, or when you're looking at your phone, um, those are bad posture positions. And so I think we need a heightened awareness of what maybe we can do to reduce 
these problems. Dr. Wong, what advice would you give these Gen Zs and other tech people when they're working on computers or on their iPhones for hours and hours and hours? Well, uh, the first thing would be to not, try not to work those hours and hours. But obviously, if you're in a situation where you have to, I would say maybe take a video of yourself doing it and, and keep that video on for quite some time. Because I think initially you start off with good posture, but as you go through the day, you get a little bit tired. And when you get tired, your muscles get a little tired fatigue it's almost like lifting a weight and holding a weight for some time your, your muscles are going to get fatigued your head is about 15 20 pounds your upper body it's a weight and be aware of your posture and, and i think you'd be surprised um, when you're looking at your phone the position of your neck when you're on your mm -hmm. computer maybe not initially Maybe at the beginning of the day, you're sitting straight up, but later in the day, you start to slouch and things like that. I would say take a video of yourself so you are aware of things that you might be doing that might be easy to correct. Very good point. So keep monitoring yourself and make sure that you're taking little breaks. I guess that's a little to rest your body because you're saying you're putting a lot of weight from the top down and reanalyze where you are and how your what your situation is. Absolutely. I think that's very important. And we don't, a lot of us don't have that self-awareness of the position that we're in, the stress we're putting on our bodies. Doctor, you've also been seeing a lot of patients with osteoporosis. For our audience, that's a condition where the bones with age become brittle and become more prone to fractures, making, surgic, making surgeries a riskier, a little bit higher. What would you suggest to our audience uh, when with those patients who need surgery? When do you know they've got to that stage? And what were the signs you would be looking for for osteoporosis and then for our patient to have surgeries? So, you know, osteoporosis is a, is a huge problem in today's world. And the first thing is to be aware of it. And a lot of people don't even realize they have it until they have a fracture or some type of problem that might be related to osteoporosis. So I think the important thing to understand is that you have to stay healthy. And part of that healthy is making sure your bone is good and strong. Understand that your peak bone age is in your early 20s. And even in your late 20s, you start losing the strength of your bone. So make sure you get a, enough nutrition. You know, these days, people are on all these crazy diets. Uh, make sure you get enough calcium, vitamin D. And then if there's any concerns, check with your doctor. They can scan your bone, see what your bone strength is. And certainly you touched on it. It was perfect. Uh, when it comes to surgery, it makes it much more difficult to deal with a patient that has osteoporosis. And, and there are even patients, we have to delay their surgery. We have to get them on the right medications, the right calcium supplements so that we can build up their bone and monitor that. And a lot of times we can't do these bigger surgeries until we correct that problem. Excellent. Dr. Wong, tell us before your patient goes into having any invasive spine surgery, what are the conservative aspects do you look at to say, ah, this patient has failed all of them. We got to go to surgery now. So number one, just understand, and I, we, we both mentioned it earlier, a vast majority of people will get better with conservative care. And so you do want to exhaust all the conservative care. Now, the thing that really I think is confusing for, for our patients is that if you go on the internet and you look for solutions to back pain or neck pain, there are going to be a million treatments out there. Sure. A million treatments. And, and it's Absolutely. hard to make sense of what really works and what doesn't work. The only thing I can say is that use common sense. And sometimes that's hard because you're getting a lot of misinformation. Yeah. Uh, but the things that really work are things that make you stronger. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. if you're going to physical therapy and all you do is lay on a table, you get heat ice massage and it's all passive, it might feel good, but you're not getting stronger. Whereas if you go to a physical therapist and they really exercise you, they make your muscles stronger, they work on body mechanics, they work on your posture, they even talk about an ergonomic evaluation to make sure your computer screen is at the right level and your chairs are good. I mean, that's going to benefit you the most. So, so for me, all the passive care, you know, is going to be somewhat of value, but the active strengthening exercises, that's usually step one. Step two is what we call pain management. We call it interventions. And those are where we can do some injections. There's a lot of different structures we can inject. We would only recommend injecting the structures that make sense ones that are more likely causing the source of pain. So if it's an epidural, a nerve block, or a facet block, or something like that. The other thing about it is that that can give us some diagnostic information. If a patient comes to see me, then they say, well, I've had all the conservative care, and when I had the injection, 
I had 100% relief for a short period of time. That helps confirm the diagnosis that that thing that they injected is the source of the pain. And actually, I think it makes the results of surgery much, much, much higher. Thank you very much for explaining that, Dr. Wong. Let's talk about minimally invasive spine surgery. We've heard a lot of things about it recent, recent years. So how are these techniques really changing the game for the patients, specifically in terms of their recovery or their getting back to normal lives or work? Would you like to explain or a little elaborate about uh, these techniques and how they're helping patients? Absolutely. So everyone is really excited. As a spine surgeon, I, I, I'm really excited about doing minimally invasive procedures when appropriate. I can tell you every patient that comes to me that has failed the conservative care and they're thinking about surgery, every single patient wants a minimally invasive surgery. Uh, sure. Not every patient will qualify. Sometimes the pathology is too great and we just can't do it minimally invasively. However, for the patients where there are appropriate candidates, it really has changed the game. And when I say old days, when I was in training, we used to have to make pretty long incisions so that we could see the anatomy with our own eyes in order to do the surgery. Nowadays, with the technologies we have, we can make very small skin incisions and underneath the skin, we can visualize what we need to see. And so it really has resulted in faster surgeries, smaller incisions, smaller incisions, less pain, less muscle damage from the surgery, faster recovery, faster back to getting your therapy, which means faster return to work, faster return to activities. So I do think it's been a game changer and, and patients really love it. Excellent. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Wong. Let's stay on that topic and tell us, talk about a little bit about the complications. And as this is spine surgery, consequences are big if things go wrong. Tell us a little bit about what complications one should look for just generally for gen when you're going out for surgery, you're meeting a spine surgeon. What are the risks? Obviously, we know the benefits now. Would you explain a little bit of, about the focus for the patient's safety while their spine surgeons may push boundaries a little bit? What are the things we should look for or be aware of? So I, I think number one, everyone has to understand that when you're doing a spine surgery or any surgery for that matter, complications can occur. Um, and, and I kind of look at the complications as something that no one wants to occur. Patients don't want it. Surgeons don't want it. No, no one wants it. Uh, so that's number one. But I think number two, what you have to understand is that there are different risk factors for different complications. Uh, the example I always give is I can do the same surgery on two different patients. One patient is an 18-year-old healthy college student, and the other person is a 98-year-old guy who has had three heart attacks already this year. You right. can do the same surgery on those two patients, and one of those patients is less likely to have complications, the younger, healthier person, and the older person probably is more likely to have some type of complications. Um, I always try to divide them into medical versus technical. Technical complications are things that can occur with any spine surgery. Um, a screw can break that we put in. Uh, sometimes the bone doesn't heal. Sometimes the nerve doesn't recover. And that, that just can happen with any patient. The medical complications are kind of what I was alluding to earlier is that the healthier you are, the better and more likely you're less to get, get through the surgery without a complication. And so for me, it's about being as healthy you are, getting strong before the surgery. I think we all think about, hey, if I'm running a race, I'm gonna prepare and train for it. I think surgery should be the same thing. And so one of the things that we do is we prepare patients tremendously for surgery. We have what's called ERAS, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. And it's a scientific method of just minimizing complications. And basically you take the patient from before surgery all the way through surgery to the post-op period, and you enact all the best practices to reduce all these complications. It's a bit complicated, uh, but I can tell you that all the programs have worked it out and we address everything nutrition, just scrubbing the skin where the incision is going to be, getting uh, the medical parameters optimized. It, it's really just kind of getting the patient healthy and ready for surgery. Excellent. I think that covers, which was going to be our next question about the post-op techniques you're deploying. And you mentioned ERAS, which seems like a comprehensive program, more so that's aiding your recovery for the patient after the procedure. So that's fantastic. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Wong. You mentioned before that one of the most exciting advancements 
in spine care is the use of robotics, which is now assisting surgeons across many surgeries. And we, we want to know a little bit about that from your perspective. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about AI in the operating room. Would you like to elaborate that for us, Serge? Yeah, so very, very excited about robotics and navigation. I would say in the spine realm, that's really allowed us to do these minimally invasive surgeries at what I call extend our visualization. And that means sure. we no longer have to make these really long incisions because with Excellent. navigation, we can see the anatomy three dimensionally on a computer screen while we're in the operating room. And when we're putting our instruments there, we don't have to make a big incision to see the anatomy in order to, to address that pathology, because underneath the skin, we were looking at a computer screen and we it allows us to see it virtually, but it's like re the real anatomy there in real time. And so sure. navigation has been fantastic. Robotics has been fantastic. You know, initially it was just allowing us to place the screws in a sure. more efficient way and more mm -hmm. accurately. And it, it's interesting, if you looked at my post-op x-rays, and you would sit there and say, well, you could almost tell which ones I've used the robot and which ones I didn't use the robot. They're right. both fine. They both, the patients have healed, but you'll see the screws are perfect. They're all in alignment. The rods are completely straight. And, wow. and again, I can, using the robot, I can make a small incision to place a big piece of hardware uh, with the use of robotics. And, and we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Right sure. now, robotics, even though it's exciting in, in spine surgery, we're just seeing the very beginning and it's really gonna expand as we sort of um, move on into the future. Excellent, that's very encouraging. On that same topic, robotic surgery, a little bit more. Where do you envision this in the next five to 10 years or more? Robotics uh, first, and then a little bit about AI impact on back surgery specifically. So uh, those are great questions. I mean, uh, first of all, robotics, we're just seeing the initial part of it. It's going to advance into right now. It's about more fusions and hardware placement and things like that. I think mm -hmm. um, it's going to allow us to do more minimally invasive procedures because with the robot, we can target very intricate and anatomical areas just through sure. a small stab incision rather than opening it up. Uh, we're going to extend it to decompressions where Currently now, <clears throat> even with our minimally invasive retractors and our microscopes, we make a small opening and going down and we have to visualize the anatomy to actually decompress it. With sure. robotics, if we can plan that on the computer screen sure. before surgery, we might be able to do that same surgery just through a small pinhole, just trusting the robot to do the, the drilling down to the, like the spinal cord and the nerves. So I do think it's going to revolutionize things. We, we still have to perfect it. We're not at that stage yet, but it's certainly very exciting. Excellent, excellent. And just on a global impact question, in the past few years, we're seeing obviously a lot of breakthrough advances in robotic surgery, like you mentioned, and AI helping us in diagnosis, and then the aspect of bioengineered discs and replacements and new substitutes coming in. What's exciting you the most? Well, all of that is very exciting. I mean, I mean, I think the most important thing about AI is going to be what we talked about earlier, which patients are right for surgery, which ones are more likely to have a complication, which patients based on just their demographics, their symptoms and the pathology were likely to benefit most from surgery, which ones may not, which ones are more likely to have complications. We have all that data. We just have to put it together and with AI, maybe it allows us to synthesize it and almost have a computer program, like you're, you're thinking about surgery, this is your risk of which complication and which specific complication. Um, as far as what you alluded to about 3D printed cages, new um, bioactive substitutes um, for fusion, for new devices, I think that's only going to expand in the future. You know, everyone's anatomy is different. Most of the time right now, when you are doing a fusion, you're doing a disc replacement or something, you basically have a standard set of instruments and implants of different sizes. In the future, we may be able to personalize it for the patient's specific anatomy. You know, we're doing it right now for patients with tumors because the tumors has, have, have eaten away parts of the spine and we, we need special cages that are gonna allow us to correct that problem and replace that part of the spine that's been eaten away with the tumor. 
that's obviously different for every every single patient. But what if we did that for routine surgeries, right? Personalize the implants wow. to match that person's anatomy. And I think that hopefully will give us more anatomical fits, better results, better healing, and ultimately, hopefully better outcomes. So thank you for that answer as well. And you just mentioned something that's coming up a lot, and that's personalized care, huge explosion in the cancer field and in other areas. Uh, what's there for spine patients? Um, are you now started to talk about tailored treatment for different patients? You already mentioned that. What are you seeing in this field? And uh, what's on the horizon in spine surgery for us? Well, that, that's a very exciting part of the future and something that I, I'm very excited about because I think what we understand is not everyone's the same. We may have the same diagnosis, but maybe our pathology is a little bit different. Um, we may have the same diagnosis, but our anxieties about what occurs with different treatment, our anxiety about complications is, is different. Um, our, our potential to recover, our potential to rehab, uh, different ages, different health statuses, um, different physical body habitus and things like that. Sure. So for me, you know, we always talk about every patient is unique. Uh, but yet we have a lot of standard things for, for each patient. We have standard protocols, standard surgeries, standard implants. For me, personalized medicine is going to be taking the individual into account and looking at wow. every aspect, not just the implants, not just which surgery, which is more likely to be successful, uh, but really taking into account their mental status, their age, what they do in the world. You know, if wow. you're a, a laborer, you might need a little bit of a different surgery for the same problem than someone who's very sedentary. If you're a 83 year old female who is not as active as a 18 year old athlete, maybe for the same treatments, you would go a different route and you might even do a different surgery, uh, knowing uh, about the lifespan, the activity level and things like that. So for me, personalized medicine represents just personalizing everything, mental, physical outcomes and your activities of daily living. Brilliant. Sounds very heartening to us. Thank you for answering that, Dr. Wang. We're just going to move on to the final one or two questions. And one of them is about prevention. Um, obviously, it's ideal. Everyone wants to know, what can I do? How can I prevent? How can I minimize the spine wear and tear? Tell our audience, sir, what do you think we could do in our daily life to have a healthy spine and avoid surgery altogether? So number one, part of spine degeneration is genetics. So there's some, there's parts of that degeneration you're not going to be able to change, but absolutely too, the environmental factors. Um, what I can say is that at our university, when I look at these football players, these guys are 18, 19 year old, and sure. you look at their spines and you're saying, these spines look like a 50 year old person because of all the stress, wear and tear. So what I always tell my patients is that prevention is the key. Uh, number one, think about the stress you're putting on your spine. Now sure. we can't always minimize it. We'd always, and we might be passionate about certain activities, but I mean, is, is there something where maybe you could sort of take into account the impact it has on the spine? For example, doing squats or jumping up and down with weights. Can you get the same exercise by uh, doing leg presses and maybe taking some of the stress off your spine? Think about your body position. We talked earlier about when you're on a computer or looking at your phone, be aware of your body position. Same thing when you're working out. Are there exercises you can do to get the same sure. health benefits, same strength benefits, but actually take some of the stress off your spine? And so I think there's a lot you can do. But I think the last thing is just be as healthy. If you are healthy, as an individual, your spine sure. is gonna be healthier. And, yeah. and so the best thing about prevention is just staying healthy. And if you're healthy for the rest of your body, your spine's gonna be happy. Healthy lifestyle. So your summary, I think, is that's being a very big factor even across the body for all organs, but for spine as well. And the second part you said is talk about less impactful exercises. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Wong. Finally, we wanna ask our guest, how do you see envision spine surgery what innovations i know you mentioned a few but what innovations excite you the most some breakthrough stuff that's knocking on the door and we'd be excited about it and your final thoughts sure 
I think the thing that really excites me the most, and, and obviously this is kind of in the into the future, but is the ability to image pain. Uh, currently, when we image the spine with MRIs, CAT scans, or X-rays, we're basically just looking at the anatomy, right? We can see abnormalities, we can see wear and tear, but right now we can't see where the pain is coming from. We kind of equate the two, meaning if I see a lot of arthritis at one area of the spine, it, we, we know it can cause pain, but I can't be absolutely sure that that's the source of the pain. Or what about a patient that has multiple areas where there can be possibly coming from pain, uh, but you can't figure out which one. Uh, with the newer MRIs, with maybe some sort of injectable radioactive metabolites and things like that, I think we might be able to look biologically, combine that with the imaging and not only image the abnormalities, the wear and tear and the arthritis, but also try to figure out what is causing the pain. For me, that's probably the most exciting part of it. Um, the other part, think about when you have back pain, we, we talked about it's very common, but most people don't go to surgery. What if we could sort of image their pain and say, listen, it's really from maybe the muscles, it's from the ligaments, it's not anything structurally in your spine. It would save a lot of anxiety and also save a lot on the operative treatment. Appreciate that. Well, that's all the time we have for today, everyone. I want to say a huge thank to Dr. Wong for sharing his valuable insights with us. Truly appreciate it. And thank you very much, Dr. Wong. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.